Open your Bibles, if you would, and then we'll pause for a moment and have a word of prayer. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, where we are, study of spiritual gifts. Uh, this year, we've taken them from this passage, and we're in a specific section of study uh, called, and the way Paul broke 1 Corinthians down, he called this section uh, questions from the congregation. Uh, and he's going to try to resolve some problems within the congregation regarding spiritual gifts. And he writes chapters 12, 13, and 14, which is part of that section. Now, the section is a large section. It's from the 7th chapter through to the 15th. That's a large section. And uh, in the 7th chapter, verse 1, he tells you that the congregation has asked questions. He's responding to them scripturally. And this is really... Uh, Chapter 12 is a go-to passage when people are having problems in the church with spiritual gifts. They don't understand them. They don't know how they function. Uh, there's misunderstanding about their function or the gifts and all of that. This is the go-to, and especially the passage I'm in today. This is a really strong go-to passage, so I want you to pay attention to it because this passage is a, is a passage you, I do. I use a lot with people who, who, are, who have misunderstanding about gifts. It's a go-to passage. And uh, remember that Paul, in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, what chapter 12 is about is to show how the Godhead is involved in spiritual gifts. You remember that? He showed how uh, God the Father, God the Son, he called him the Lord, and the Holy Spirit are all involved in spiritual gifts, in the distribution in their ministry, in their performance, and the overall picture of the plan of God. Now what he did, he, he did that up here in verses 4, 5, and 6. <clears throat> now what, he, what he's done now is he's gone to show you, like I wrote on your paper, he showed you the Holy Spirit's involvement in, chap in, in chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. And today we're going to talk about the Lord's involvement which, which he mentions in verse 5, is found in 12 through 17. And then next week, we'll deal with God's involvement with spiritual gifts, which he mentions in verse 6 and is going to explain in verses 18 through 31. This passage today is really, is really now, 12 through 17 will be important, so will 18 through 31 be very important because he, he really gets down to answer questions about misunderstanding of how the, the, in today's passage, the function of them. A mis they didn't misunderstand the gifts. They, under they misunderstood the function, and they were having problems because of that, and he addresses it today. Here's what he says in our passage today, verse 12, dealing with Jesus Christ and the body and ministries to the body. He says, for even as the body is one and yet has many members, and he uses a human analogy, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. In other words, the one body is Christ. And the way the, the, way the body is designed is by parts called members, parts, melos, parts. We have arms, we have ears, we have eyes, parts. He calls them members, the parts. And it takes all the parts, spiritual gifts. The parts are spiritual gifts. It takes all the spiritual gifts to form the one body, which is Christ. When you, like a puzzle, when you, put the, when you get the arm and the eye and the ear, when you get all the parts right in the, in, in, in the puzzle and you look at it, you have Christ. The one body is Christ. Christ is not the arm, he's not the ear, he's not the eye. It's the body complete makes Christ. An arm by itself does not make a body. That's Paul's point today. And they were having problems with that in the church, understanding that. And so he opens it up with that idea. For by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. 
In other words, he says this idea of a mono-gifted, everybody doesn't have the same gift ever. The, you can't, the body is not one eye. The body is not one ear. You can't have an ear or a whole collection of ears and call it a body. You have body parts. You don't have a body. Verse 15 says, if the foot should say, now that would be kind of scary, but if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body. See, that was a problem they had. It is not for that reason any the less a part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body. It is for, is, is it not for this reason any the less a part of the body? In other words, the foot is part of the body, even if it thinks that it's not as important as the hand. Or the ear to the eye. Doesn't matter what the ear feels like. If you're an ear, you're important to the body. Stop worrying about not being what you're not. Worry about what you are. You're an ear, and ears for hearing. Be comfortable with that. That's his point. Then he comes, and he, he deals another issue. Now, I want you to pay attention because you can't see this. But in verse 15, the word if is spelled E-A-N. In verse 15, in verse 16, the word if is E-A-N. But in verse 17, both ifs is E-I. E-I. These are different ifs. And that's kind of important. He's, 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 he inside is changing that idea, but still on the same subject. He says, if the whole body... That's what we're after, the whole body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? In other words, the function, the purpose of the, of, the, of the ear. If the whole body were an eye, then where would the hearing be? Where would, be, where would the ear and the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, then where would the sense of smell be? And so he's went to the nose. It's not just having the part, but understanding the importance of what the part has to the body. The ear is the hearing to the body. The eye is to the seeing to the body. The nose is for the smelling to the body. The mouth is for taste and sensitivity and all that kind of thing. Notice we have four ifs. In, in these verses, we have four ifs, and they're different, right? Now, nah, come on. If you had a Greek Bible, you could look in there, and it would, you would see E-A-N, and then you would see E-E, E-I-E-I. -E -I. All right. I'm just telling you, this is the way it is. All right? And that's where I'm going. And then in verse 18, we're going to come to God's role. Sue 31. So let's have a word of prayer. I mean, this passage, now we're with the Lord because it's the body. And it's the function of the body or the ministry. What is the ministry? What is the ministry of the part called the ear? Hearing. What is the ministry part of the eye? Seeing. What is the ministry part of the nose? Smelling. You see what I mean? Who's in charge of the ministry part of that? Is the Lord. Listen to me. <laughs> He's the savior of the body. He's the head of the body, right? He's the Lord of the body. He is the body. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and I'm going to explain this. I give you a moment of silence. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude types of sins or sins of the tongue or overt sins. You must confess those, 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sin, 
he, God is faithful and just forgive you based on Christ, able to cleanse you. He says, I will forgive you and cleanse you. The cleansing, go back to verse 7, is the propitious cleansing of the work of Christ on the cross. Now, it's not for your salvation in verse 9, as some confuse, but rather for spirituality. This is a Christian confessing his sin, not for salvation. He's already saved, and he will always be. It's for renewing, getting back into fellowship with the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So I give you a moment. You're a priest. You check out your own sins and make confession if necessary. And our Father, we thank you. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our souls today about the one body, Christ, and how spiritual gifts are there to support that here on earth. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to look at four ideas today about how spiritual gifts form the one body, which we call the church, which is the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church in the world. And spiritual gifts is what make up the body. And he uses a human analogy. The human analogy is a human body. It has parts, and the parts make the whole. A part is not a whole. It takes all the parts to be a whole body. And so that's what we're after today as a member, point number one, as a member of the Godhead, the Lord, we call him Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ involvement is with the ministries or the functional part of the gift. The nose for smelling, the ear for hearing, the eye for seeing, and, and etc. Okay? And so that's very important, and we see that. Remember chapter 12, verse 5, the variety of the ministries, the functions, belong to the Lord. And he uses the word diakonia, diakonia. Sometimes in your Bible, diakonia, and maybe even in this passage, like in the King James, if I, if I remember it, or other translations, they may call it service. Service, because this word also means service. It is the function part of the ministry. Service. It's a ministry. It, but it focuses on the function side of a ministry, diakonia. And that's important that you know that, because that's what he's talking about. As the, member of this, as a second, as the second member of the Godhead, it is the Lord's responsibility to govern the ministry of all spiritual gifts given to believers at salvation. It's his responsibility. He governs these. He governs them. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, when Paul is talking about spiritual gifts in chapter 4, verses 4 through 16, he makes a big point. In verses 4, 5, and 6, he refers to the Godhead once again. And he goes beyond it. He lists a whole group. I think there are like seven ones, O-N-E. There is one Lord, one baptism, etc. You remember that? Well, I want to focus on this out of Ephesians 4, 4 through 16 for a moment, on the one body and the one Lord, how they work with spiritual gifts. Paul talks about it in this passage in Ephesians. For example, in verse 7, he starts out by telling them, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. What is Christ's gift? It is salvation. At the moment of salvation, you get your gift because the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ and into the body. That's what 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is going to teach us. For each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. In other words, salvation and gifts. We are saved by Christ's gift and the measure that's given to us by grace. Your, your gift is a grace gift. It is an earned, deserved. You can't, you, 
Whatever he gives, that's yours. Charisma, where you get charismatic from, Paul used that word grace in Romans 12 when he talked about gifts. Here he is talking to the same manner as in chapter 12 of Romans in Ephesians. In verses 10 and 11, he comes to the importance of the ascension of Jesus Christ. He dies on a cross. He's buried. He's raised from the dead the third day. That's the gospel that you have to believe to be saved. Forty days later, he ascends back to the Father and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Ten days later, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, and we have the phenomena called the church age and the church in the world. This is discussed in Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 20 through 23, and is resumed in the fourth chapter, 10 and 11, when Paul writes in parentheses, Now the expression, he ascended far above all the heavens, that's ascension and session, so that divine purpose. Now Jesus Christ has done his work on the cross, he has ascended back to the Father, and he is seated. And here it is connected with spiritual gifts, so that he might fill all things. Now, what it's about is the whole church. He's the head of the church and the Savior of the body and the Lord of it. But his job is to be sure as he governs, that every gift is meeting its potential to the body. What he wants is to govern a healthy body where each gift is functioning its maximum for the benefit of the body, which is Christ on earth, right? It, when the puzzle is done and you look at the picture... It's the picture of Jesus Christ. When you, get, when you fill all things, put all the pieces in the puzzle and stand back, what, it, what the top of the box, the Bible looks like, description of Jesus, is the one you just put together. They match. that he might fill all things, is that that's his responsibility to govern ministries of the church. It's based on his ascension session. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, the operation of spiritual gifts, he governs them, whether you're a baby believer, an immature believer, or a mature believer, or a super gracer, he governs, and he governs according to your growth. Your gift will operate at its maximum under the ministry of the Holy Spirit when a baby believer, but a baby believer who doesn't understand all the ramifications of walking consistently in the Spirit, he's in and out. Or an immature believer who's, who understands the importance of the Holy Spirit but is, is vacillating between different ideas about different ideas. He's immature. He's, one minute he's acting his age and the next moment he, Minute, he's not acting his age. It's called childish. We'll talk about it in the thirteenth chapter of First Corinthians. But it's still the problem. The still the issue for Jesus Christ is to fill the maximum of what he's dealing with. You, in the church, you have babies who have gifts. You have immature people who have gifts. You have mature people who have gifts, and you have this unique people. The pivot, the true pivot in every dispensation are the spiritual mature believers who are there and they're consistent. They're not going anywhere. The world couldn't buy them off. We call them super gracers. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, and 4. Now, he says, until we all turn, uh, attain to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. Then he comes back to the measure of the stature, stature, 
which belongs to the fullness of Christ. See, to fill all things is to get you to the fullness of Christ. He's responsible for that. He's responsible for the function of the gifts and being sure that he governs how those gifts function in baby believers, immature believers, mature believers, and super graces. And the key, the key is to get the believer out of baby into mature, out of immature into mature, and, uh, and steady in maturity to super grace. And now what you've got is you've got, he's, he's got you filled with the fullness of Christ. You're operating at a maximum. You're not easily distracted from your loyalty to Christ. You're not easily distracted. That's how you know that. Then he comes down in chapter, I'm still in Ephesians. He comes down in Ephesians 4. I'm just giving you a synoptic look of this. He comes down in chapter 4, verses 12, 13, talks about the ministry of gifts. And he singles out some like he did in our passage. He singled out nine gift, manifestating gifts. We, some people call them spectacular. The, man, the visible manifestation of them. He lists nine in our passage. He comes back and he does it again with different gifts. These are communication gifts. In verse 12, he says, he, he says, you have communication gifts. In verse 11, he lists communication gifts. Apostle, prophets, evangelists, pastors, hyphen teachers. Then he comes back in 12 and 13, talks about these gifts like he does in chapter 12 when he lists nine gifts, which are manifested gifts. He, he talks about them. And, and he's going to talk about them in chapter 13, 14, uh, 12, 13, and 14. All three chapters are about these gifts and the problems that were connected to them. Now, Paul over in Ephesians go a diff diff different way because the Ephesians are de dealing with a different problem. And so he says these communications gifts, in which he listed in verse 11, are for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. For the equipping of the saints. The, these all were communication gifts for, for equipping the saints for the work of ministry. And he's talking about gifted ministries. Diaconia. To building up the body, to the building up the body of Christ. He's talking about gifts now. He's been in this subject in this Ephesians 4 through 16. This is what he's talking about, contextually. To the building up the body of Christ, that's what he's after. He's after doing this to bring it to the fullness of Christ. He's got to work with immature baby believers, immature believers, and mature believers, and super grace people. All right. Building up the body <clears throat> until we all attain to the sure man, to the base of Christ. That's what he's after. The building up the body until we all attain to the unity of the knowledge of Christ to a mature man, etc. Then in verse 16, he says, he's after body growth. See, that filling all to the full. See, his job is in governing is to fill. He has the power to fill all the things. And what he's after is the fullness of Christ. You know what he wants? He wants that in the church. But you know where he wants it most of all is in your life. You won't get it without the word of God. Until we all turn, attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of Christ to a mature man. Now he talks about this in verse 16. From whom Christ, that's what he's talking, that's the person. From whom Christ, the whole body, being fitted and held together by whatever joint supplies, still talking about the body concept, according to the proper working of each individual part gift, causes the growth of the body of Christ for the edification or the building up of itself in love. He says there's two things in the fullness of the, 
the fullness of Christ and the love of God are manifested. He said, you're so crazy about manifested gifts. S listen, settle back. All of them are for one manifestation. That is the fullness of Christ and the love of God. You're getting hung up on a gift. You ought to get hung up on the gift is for the body to reach the full manifestation of Christ and the love of God. A healthy church is one that has reached some maturity, has taken responsibility with that because of maturity, and is able to manifest this in his life, and as the parts are manifested, this is what it comes to. This is why we teach the way we teach. I am told in Ephesians 4.11 that I have this gift. If I have that gift, I have this kind of responsibility. I'm driven by that responsibility. I'm driven by that responsibility as Jesus is driven by his responsibility, seated at the right hand of God the Father, to govern the gifts and the growth of the church. I'm driven by it. I, I don't have choices in this. I have a choice not to do it or to do it, but if I'm going to pastor or if I'm going to teach, I've got to do that. If I teach, that's one thing. If I pastor teach, I'm locked into that idea. Many of you don't understand that about me. But I can't help that. That's the difference between the gift of teacher who pick and choose from what he wants to do and the pastor teacher who can't. You're always driven by Christ in governing the growth. I don't have power over, the, over your gift. That only, that, the Holy Spirit has power over your gift. But my power is governing like Christ commands me. Now, here we go again. How does a person become a member of the church, the body of Christ, with a spiritual gifted ministry in the body of Christ? How does a person become a member with a spiritually gifted ministry in the church? Point two. See, there's a lot of confusion about that. See, here's what most churches do. When somebody joins their church, they look to appoint him some kind of ministry. Would you be a teacher? Would you sing in a choir? Would you do this? Would you do that? No gifts are ever discussed. You ever had a pastor ask you what your gift is? If, you, if you're around here, you do. I ask you all the time. I just go all the time. Don't you think it would be important to know whether the person's an eye and ear or nose or what he is? Nobody gives that. Well, if you want to become a member of this church, listen. Listen. How has a person become a member of the church of Jesus Christ? That's the bigger question. And here's the answer in point two. Spiritually gifted ministries are given with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. At the moment of grace salvation by means of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Once again, on the top of your paper, I, there's enough room for you to write the symbol of the gospel. You put a cross. Remember, draw a cross. Draw a line down to burial. That's death of Christ on the cross. Draw a line beneath the cross. Draw it slanted to burial. And then go straight up and put an put a arrow on it for the resurrection. Death, burial, and resurrection is a gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 tells you that Christ died according to our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and raised from the dead according to the scriptures. That's Old Testament, by the way. 
New Testament hadn't been written. It was in the process when he said that. Romans 1.16 says that the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, least any man boast. They, all the boast goes to God and Christ, doesn't it? Now, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you receive a spiritual gift. It's one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit. It's salvation under the new covenant. We're, ch we're church age. We're new covenant. Whether you know it or not, we're new covenant. And the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you receive eight works of the Holy Spirit. You can find that in our pamphlet, 50 Things You Can Never Lose in Time and Eternity. One of those is to give you a spiritual gift. The Holy Spirit distributes you a gift at the point of salvation. He regenerates you. And he baptizes you into Christ. Now, at the, at right where the bottom, at the bottom of the cross, put a, put a little dot there and draw a line out from it and put a circle. And on that line, up to that circle, put the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can put BHS. It'll be all right. The baptism, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are baptized, that circle up there put in Christ. You are baptized into Christ. Let me show it to you. And what, next to that top circle, I want you to write Galatians 3.27. I'm going to pound this until you learn it. I'm going to pound it until you learn it. And as soon as you learn it, you'll start teaching it, and we'll both be happy. Verse 27. For all of you, not some of you, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Baptized into Christ. Baptized into Christ. Clothed with Christ has 20 status privileges. That's positional sanctification. That's positional sanctification. I got it at the point of salvation. I was baptized. I was baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. I didn't do anything to deserve it. I believe the gospel in Christ because I live under, under, in the church age, under the new covenant. This is the way it works. Did you write Galatians 3, 27 there? Good. Now, underneath that circle, draw a line down and draw another circle. And that's in the body. That's, the, that's in the body, the church. And write 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I'm going to hold my place in Galatians and draw back to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I'm going to hold my place and I'm going to come back. For Here's what he says. For by one spirit we were all, not some, we were all baptized into one body. He's talking about Christ, the church. Whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we were all made to drink one spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now back, back into Galatians, the third chapter, verse 28. 328. Here's what he said. In verse 27, he says, we were all baptized into Christ, and you've clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, verse 28, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. You see that? Because the body is Christ. The body is Christ. Now, between the top circle and the top bottom circle... Write the word equality. Equality. Because what we were told by these two baptisms, which occur at the same time, that we have equality in Christ. Right? Neither this nor that. Neither this nor that. 
Neither this, neither that. Neither this, neither that. Neither this, neither that. What's his point? Equality in Christ. We are one in Christ. We don't have all these social stigmas on us in Christ. Who we are in Christ are the 20 status privileges. We're a son of God. We're eternal life. We're, all these things is who we are. How we've been labeled by the world is not who we are. Well, you're a Jew, you're a Greek, you're a black, you're a white, you're rich, you're poor, you're educated, you're not. None of that applies to this. None of that. Equality in Christ is the name of the game. You need to start seeing people with the eyes of truth of Christ. If they believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're in Christ. If they're in Christ, they're in the church, right? How did they become a member of the church of Jesus Christ? They got baptized. They believed the gospel and got baptized by the Holy Spirit. Put them in, he put them into Christ and into the body at the same time. You got that? Now, if you'd like, I got a bottom circle, haven't I? So you could draw a line from the bottom circle to the to the bottom of the cross. And now you have the top circle, bottom circle. Now, the bottom circle is dealing with the, the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit by walking in the Spirit, by being guided by the Holy Spirit. It's the life, of, the life that the Holy Spirit brings of Christ in you and to you. Do you understand that? Now you don't, but I'm just telling you. That's the top circle, bottom circle. That's the connection. You know, what that, you know what that entire thing's about? Starting with the cross, going to Christ, going to the church. You know what that whole, that whole uh, upper body, you know what that whole deal is? That whole symbol we just did, you know what that is? Grace. The grace of God. It's all the grace of God. You see, you're a member of the church of Jesus Christ. You joined it when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're in it whether you want to go to it or not. It's part of the package deal. <laughs> and it's all grace. My, my, my. And it's all grace. This is Paul's argument. Paul made it in Romans, but Paul made it in Ephesians. Paul made it in Corinthians. This is Paul's argument. He made it everywhere he talks about gifts, he talks about them this way. These are the great passages. He's Ephesians 4, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 13, 14. These are the great passages on it. Now, there are other passages like 1 Peter 4 and other places mention them, but nowhere like this. I mean, he just, he gets in it. And we're benefited from it, certainly. So we see that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit, is important. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit puts us into Christ, puts us into the body of Christ. We also see that the distribution of the spiritual gift is another work of the Holy Spirit, where at the point of salvation, he, distri he, he distributes. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says he distributes the gift. That's his, that's his deal. His deal is to give it to you and then cause, cause you to understand that it functions under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Listen, on your best day, the Holy Spirit will never work in the flesh. It always works in the power of the Holy Spirit. Unbelievers don't, don't get these gifts and can't do them. These are supernatural abilities, not natural. People make that confusion. The Holy Spirit baptizes the church-age believers, the cab, church-age believers into Christ and into the body of Christ as salvation. I pointed that out. I also pointed it out on your paper that both times it's referred to as an, uh, uh, an heiress passive indicative. 
at the point of salvation, it is the work of the Holy Spirit and into Christ. You're into Christ on the one hand and into the body of Christ on the other hand. And this is really important. In the Greek language, those are, those, that, that grammar is really important to you. Therefore, Jesus is the Savior of the body, its head, and he's the Lord. Point number four. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 17, Paul used two unique conditional clauses. He used the EAN, which is a third class condition, in verses 15 and 16, and he used an EI if, a first class condition, a third class condition, maybe, maybe yeah, maybe no, maybe this, maybe that, probability, possibility. The EI says this is, if this is true, then this is true. All right. Now, he's going to use both of these in the most unique ways with two different ideas about gifts. And I don't want you to miss this. He's going to answer the congregation's questions regarding spiritually gifted ministries. And he's going to tell them in a nice pastoral way that their ideas are absurd. <laughs> Paul had some polish. In verse 15 and 16, he used the EAN if third class condition. He said, if the foot should say, now we know a foot can't talk, and if it does, it would scare us to death. We only see it in cartoons that we feel comfortable about it. If we went to, an, if we went to a hospital, and we had, it would scare us. We think it was a zombie hospital or something. If the foot should say, I am not a hand, then I'm, am I not part of the body of Christ? See, it's absurd. Under any condition, it's absurd. It's absurd that a foot could say, but what's more absurd is what the foot was saying. Therefore, what was the foot saying? What was the foot saying to the hand? The foot is a spiritual gift speaking to another spiritual gift that if I don't have yours, I'm not part of the body. Right? Paul, in his nice pastoral way, said, that's nuttier than a fruitcake. Or, that's absurd. Then he comes back, in case you didn't get it, and says it again. He took a different, he took two different parts or gifts. If the ear, that's a spiritual gift, part of the body, should say, if I'm not an eye, then am I not part of the body? Right? That's absurd. Why don't you be content with what you are? And let that ministry be spectacular. That is absurd. Would you agree with that? Not that the foot could speak to the hand, or what was it, the eye, or the ear to the eye. That's not what is absurd. Listen to me. It's what they were saying. That if I didn't have this gift, I know I got this gift, but I want that gift, then I think that gift's more important. I'm probably not part of the body of Christ. That's absurd, is his point. The foot needs to be content to be the foot to the body. The foot is not for the foot, it's for the body. The ear is not for itself, it's for the body. It's to give hearing to the whole body. Well, I want to be, I want to be sight. 
look, why aren't you content with what God's done for you in grace? You can't change this. They're not exchangeable. These, you can't do that. You might put a liver with a liver or a kidney with a kidney, but you, you can't put a finger there and it work. Well, I think I'll have a transplant today instead of I need a, a, a new kidney, but I think I'll just, put, I think I'll just take a, I don't need my big thumb. I think I'll take my big thumb and, thumb and use it. Well, that's crazy. You can't do that. That's nuts. See, that's the way I would respond, but he was more pastoral than I am. <clears throat> He's a little more polished with it. He said, that's absurd in the Greek language. He says, that's, that's absurd. Then he comes to the if. In verse 17, he puts two EIs. He said, if the whole body were an eye, if that was true, it isn't. <laughs> it would scare me to death if I came to church today and all I had was eyes. It's bad enough that you have as many as you have, but... That freaked me out. I mean, all, all my subject I would have to do with eyes. I mean, what, what could I have? What could I do? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? You see, he's talking about a group of people that want to have mono-gifted churches. That one gift is supreme over the other gifts. We still have that foolishness today. Well, if you don't do this, you're probably not part of the body of Christ. I'll, I'll explain it in a moment. Where would the hearing be? Well, there wouldn't be any. Therefore, that'd be absurd. If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? It wouldn't be. Therefore, that's absurd. Your gift has been chosen for you. It fits who you are in the plan of God. Your only responsibility is find out what it is and then work, let, that, let the Holy Spirit work that gift in you by you walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.16. Paul is saying that holding such views regarding spiritual gifts is absurd. Making the body of Christ mono-gifted is absurd. In 1 Corinthians 12, 1, he opened up by calling it agnosio. In other words, without doctrinal knowledge of the function of spiritual gifts. You are ignorant of the knowledge of how spiritual gifts function. Paul was cor correcting problems submitted by the congregation regarding the function of spiritual gifts. Let me give you one and I'll close. Here's a common one in my day. But Paul's listening to the congregation of what they were having. I'm going to give you a false concept of spiritual gifts. I hear this all the time, and here's the passage that refutes it. If you do not speak in tongues, you, do not, you have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Meh. If you do not speak in tongues, you do not, you, you have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Eh. How do I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit baptizes me based on that. Into Christ and into his body. Now later, when Paul gets into really dealing with tongues in chapter 14, in 13 and 14, we'll see this clearly. But I hear this all the time. And their assumption is, here, here's the danger. I mean, this is so wacky anyhow, but here's the danger. If you do not speak in tongues, then you, do not, then you have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then the, then the conclusion is, if you do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then you are not part of the body of Christ. You understand how dangerous that is? And you know what refutes that? The passage I just taught you. As we might say, it blows it out of the water. 
It takes it out of the discussion because that is absurd. Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll take a 15-minute break and we'll come back and do the Eucharist. The Eucharist. Our Father, we're thankful today for the study of the Word of God out of Paul as he teaches on spiritual gifts. And today, he talks about absurdity, just plain absurdity in the church. It's okay if we're open to correction and training in righteousness. where we can find profit for going to church and growing. I pray today, Father, as we take this collection, that we'd be good stewards as leaders of the church to keep our, our light burning with the, le the least cost we can to reach the maximum amount of people that need to hear the gospel and need to have spiritual growth momentum in their life. Encourage our hearts, Father, to be truthful to that in Jesus' name. Amen.